Leia here from LeiaForSci.com, and in this video, we're going to look at the physical properties of alcohol from hydrogen bonding to solubility and boiling point. In the last video, we introduced the alcohol functional group as an OH with a polar covalent bond having a partial negative on oxygen and partial positive hydrogen. You can find it along with the entire alcohol video series practice quiz and cheat sheet by visiting my website, layerforsci.com slash alcohol. This polar bond, or dipole, allows the alcohol to have dipole-dipole interactions, but even more so, it allows the alcohol group to do hydrogen bonding. Remember that hydrogen, just like you, likes to have fun, spelled F-O-N, where a hydrogen atom bound to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen will be so partially positive that it'll be attracted to another fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. In case of the alcohol, we're just looking at the O in fun, but that oxygen is partially negative, hydrogen partially positive, and will be very strongly attracted to another alcohol molecule. If you're asked to draw it out, you can't simply put two alcohols face to face and draw an interaction between them. The reason this won't happen is both of the hydrogen atoms are partially positive and like charges repel but opposite charges attract. Instead you have to line them up so that the partially negative oxygen is close to the partially positive hydrogen. This allows the partially negative oxygen and partially positive hydrogen on the left to interact with each other and the hydrogen on the right interact with the oxygen on the right. What you see here are actually two sets of hydrogen bonds because each of these scenarios where a partially negative oxygen attracts a partially positive hydrogen is considered one hydrogen bond and this is considered a very strong intermolecular force, much stronger than things like van der Waals or London dispersion. But it's not just hydrogen bonding between the alcohol functional groups that we care about, it's also the hydrogen bonds between alcohol and water. For example, if we take methanol, which is the smallest alcohol, and throw it into a whole lot of water molecules, what happens? The oxygen is partially negative, hydrogen partially positive, but water has a very similar structure. Instead of ROH, water is HOH. Each of the bonds between hydrogen and oxygen will be polar covalent, giving us a partially negative oxygen and two partially positive hydrogen atoms. Water, like the alcohol, is capable of hydrogen bonding, but more exciting, it's capable of hydrogen bonding with alcohol in solution. We can show various water molecules lining up around the alcohol group so that the partially negative oxygen of alcohol always lines up with the partially positive hydrogen, and the partially positive hydrogen always lines up with a partially negative oxygen of water. If water gets along so well with alcohol, it's not surprising to see how well it can dissolve within that solution. Which brings up the next question. Are alcohol molecules soluble in water? And are they miscible in water? Soluble and miscible sound like the same thing, but they're really not. When we say something is soluble in water, we can say that it dissolves in water, and we're not referring to any specific amount, it's more of a generic term. When we say something is miscible, we're defining the parameters. We're saying that it will dissolve at any ratio. Say I want to create a solution with methanol and water. To say that methanol is miscible with water, that means it would dissolve if I have a 1 to 10 ratio, a 1 to 50 ratio, or even a 50 to 1 ratio. It means no matter how much of each I use, they're going to mix together to form a homogeneous solution. Why does this matter so much? We saw that methanol is very happy when dissolved with water, because methanol is a tiny molecule that has a methyl group and the OH. Because water gets along so well with alcohol, we can say that alcohol is hydrophilic. Hydro meaning water and philic from phile meaning loving. This is the opposite of hydrophobic, which is water fearing, as we'll see shortly. 
When we compare the size, the carbon portion of the molecule is very close in size to the OH portion of the molecule. Carbon has nonpolar bonds. The electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen is so close that there is no polarity in that portion of the molecule. That means if water tries to surround this portion of the methanol, it doesn't get along, it doesn't know how to interact. I want you to imagine that you're hanging out with your friend and you really like your friend, but you really don't like your friend's significant other. So there's gonna be some tension because you like your friend, but then there's that other person that you just can't get along with. Now, if that person doesn't bother you, if the carbon group is small, it doesn't really make a difference. But the bigger the carbon group, the more it starts to matter. If we look at something like ethanol, which is grain alcohol or drinking alcohol, it's still pretty small. We have a carbon group, a carbon group, and an OH group. And we can estimate that the alcohol is about a third of the molecule. It's still close enough to a majority. Water can still play a nice role in helping dissolve. And so ethanol is going to be soluble in water. But the more carbons you add to the chain, the more and more that nonpolar portion takes over, the less and less that OH group matters. Say we have butanol. The alcohol is now about a fifth of the total molecule. That means about 80% of this molecule, the four carbon groups, are water-fearing or hydrophobic. Now it's not just hanging out with your friend and their significant other, but your friend's significant other's three other friends are also there. So you have the one person you get along with, the four other people that you don't. Now we're getting into iffy territory. A small amount of butanol will still be soluble, but butanol isn't considered miscible with water. Because if I start throwing a lot of butanol into water, they're going to start separating because the water is getting crowded out. It's not able to mix with that hydrophobic tail. Which brings us to the general solubility rule for alcohol. Small alcohols are soluble in water, but as you increase the number of carbon atoms on the alcohol molecule, you decrease the solubility of that alcohol in water. Let's forget about water and look at what happens when you have just alcohol. More importantly, what happens to the boiling point of this alcohol solution? Boiling point simply tells us the temperature at which a solution will boil or the temperature required to go from a liquid to a gas. But these are just the facts. If you can understand what happens in boiling point, you'll have a much better understanding of the trends for alcohol boiling points. I want you to imagine that we have a solution of pure alcohol. Every single molecule in here is an alcohol molecule, and they're constantly moving around in solution. Remember, a liquid has a definitive volume, but it's always mobile, it's always moving around. What allows it to stay in that container are the small interactions that happen between the alcohol molecules. These are your intermolecular forces. The intermolecular forces include the hydrogen bonding between the alcohol portion of the molecule and the London dispersion forces between the carbon portions of the molecule. Boiling point we set as temperature and temperature is a measure of heat. What we're really looking at is the energy required to overcome all of these intermolecular forces, to break the interactions between the molecules, so that if you have a molecule that is no longer holding on to the other liquid molecules, there's nothing to keep it in the container, nothing to keep it in solution, and so it floats away having evaporated from the liquid to the gas phase. In other words, the boiling point is the amount of heat required, as measured by temperature, to overcome the intermolecular forces, which then allows the molecules to escape as a gas. Based on this new definition, what would you expect for an alcohol boiling point? Let's take a look at two isomers of C2H6O. We can draw it as the two-carbon alcohol ethanol, or as dimethyl ether with a methyl group on either side of an oxygen atom. They have the same molecular formula, therefore the same molecular weight. But if you look at their boiling points, they're going to be extremely different. The boiling point of ethanol is about 78 degrees Celsius. 
but the boiling point of dimethyl ether is about negative 24 degrees Celsius. How can two molecules with the same structure have such a different boiling point? Well, ask yourself, why does this structure require so much more energy to separate the liquid molecules compared to this one? And the answer is the greater intermolecular forces, specifically the hydrogen bonding. Remember, alcohol can do hydrogen bonding, which is such a strong intermolecular force that it's going to require so much more energy to break apart. This is when we're looking at two same size molecules. But unlike the trend with solubility, where increasing the size of the alcohol decreased solubility, it'll be the exact opposite with boiling point. Let's compare a few common alcohols. If I look at methanol, which has just one carbon, the boiling point is about 65 degrees Celsius. If I add just one carbon to give me ethanol, the boiling point goes up slightly till 78 degrees Celsius. If I add two more carbon atoms for butanol, the boiling point jumps up even more to about 118 degrees Celsius. And the question is why? If the alcohol group is the same, we're not increasing any hydrogen bonding, what happens with the larger molecules that a solution of long chain alcohol requires so much more energy to separate? Simple, we have two types of intermolecular forces. We have to account for the energy to break the hydrogen bonding between alcohol groups, but we also have to account for the London dispersion forces required to break the carbon to carbon interactions. But it's not just the number of carbon atoms that we look at, it's also the way that they're connected. If we look at three versions of C4H10O, or the isomers of butanol, we get the regular linear butanol, we have the sec butyl alcohol, where the OH sits on the sec or secondary carbon, and we have the tert butyl alcohol, where the OH sits on the tertiary carbon. The boiling point for butanol is about 118 degrees. If we add one branch, sec butanol has a boiling point of just 100 degrees Celsius. Another branch for tert butanol drops it down to 83 degrees Celsius. So what happened here? Didn't we say that increasing the number of carbons increases the boiling point? Yes and no. We said that increasing the intermolecular forces will increase the boiling point because we require more energy to separate it. The reason butanol has such a high boiling point is because the molecules are able to stack up. They're able to get so close at every atom, so every carbon is able to hold on to a portion of the other molecule. With the sec butyl alcohol, having that branch in there, having that OH stand in the way, we can get as tight stacking. So yes, these two can very nicely line up with each other, but I can't stack a third one on there. If I try to stack a third alcohol, I have to squeeze it into the side, and it can't get as close. It can't hold on as tightly, so I don't need as much energy to break it. The tert butyl alcohol has so much more branching that even two molecules have a hard time getting close enough to each other, and the energy to break them apart is going to be so much less, which drops the boiling point down by almost 20 degrees from the sec butyl alcohol. Be sure to join me in the next video where we look at the acid-base properties of alcohols. You can find that video along with the entire video series Practice Quiz and Cheat Sheet by visiting my website leahforsci.com alcohol.